results, benefits, advantages, outcomes. That's what's really driving the decision of your decision maker, is the results, benefits, advantages, and outcomes that you can deliver to them to help them attain a more favorable future by improving their condition. And I always stress that to people, George. Those are the two driving motivators for every decision maker. Number one is how do you improve their condition? And number two is how do you help them attain a more favorable future? Welcome to Your Intended Message, the perfect place for leaders and promising professionals who want to convey the intended message for greater success. Every week, we interview experts who address the challenges and best practices to deliver your message effectively. That might be one-to-one, one, one to few, or one-to-many. And perhaps the most important conversation, one to self. I'm your host, George Torok. My guest today is Jeff Blackman. Here's three facts that I think you should know about Jeff. One, he is a speaker, an author, a success coach, and a lawyer. Uh, we won't make any lawyer jokes today, Jeff. Uh, two, he is a talk show host. And as a talk show host, some of the people he's interviewed include Oprah Winfrey, Ted Koppel, and Jerry Seinfeld. The one thing, of course, he's never done is he's never had the pleasure that I have of interviewing Jeff Blackman. And third, the third fact about Jeff is, uh, as a child, he was uh, a guitarist in a band uh, of 13-year-olds, and they called themselves Rated X. On top of that, we know he's a fan of Lost Causes. He's a Chicago Cubs fan. <laughs> Jeff Blackman, welcome to your intended message. Hey, thanks a bunch, George. It was a long time for my beloved Cubbies between 1908 to 2016, but after 108 years of suffering, Hey, we finally, finally got ourselves a World Series championship. And you also make an assumption that I've never interviewed myself. I, I actually talk to myself on a regular basis, George, but that just confuses my wife and children. <laughs> I have that, that same affliction. There I am, Georgie Porgy's talking to himself. <laughs> hey, if you and I ever run out of our guests, we've got each other, so. You bet. <laughs> and, and, and holding over the Cubs, there's persistence. And persistence and consistency is one of the aspects that I believe you emphasize in how people should communicate their message, how they should try to get their message across. Where have you seen that work for you? Where have you seen that happen? How have you helped your clients with that? Well, one of the interesting things about practice and preparation is that it actually drives prosperity and profit. So I really work with my clients on an ongoing basis with the significance of intelligent, valuable repetition. And I tell them that repetition and reinforcement is what eventually drives internalization. And internalization is what drives execution. So we have just begun the NFL season. So I love also watching Canadian football because it's so wide open. So whether it's Canadian football or whether it's football here in the States, here's the key thing they have in common. We always hear this word and that is reps. We talk about during training camp of reps for the quarterback, for the running backs, for the offensive or defensive line, for the wide receivers, George. It's no different in business. And when I work with my clients, I often encourage them on a regular basis to engage in intelligent repetition because that ongoing process of really working on a specific skill or an attitude or a behavior is what drives results. And as an athlete, I learned that, the value of taking lots of swings in the batting cages, taking lots of round balls. But if you'd like, I can even share a very early story, communications related, about the significance of repetition and practice. Please tell us. So people often ask me about persistence and perseverance, and they make an assumption. The assumption is, hey, Jeff, we've heard you speak. 
And we know that you are trained as an attorney, although I do not practice law, I've been an attorney since 1982. Thankfully, never practiced a day of the law in my life, which for me was the right decision. And the background's also broadcasting, as you alluded to, both radio and TV here in Chicago. Yet what happened is, with respect to my speaking, is that in the beginning, and I'm talking first grade, I couldn't do it, George. I had a speech impediment. So I often share this story with people because it shows the fact that I'm human and I'm vulnerable. And that's very important for a communicator is to be vulnerable and relatable. So when I was in first grade, I was asked by my teacher, Donna Northrup, to please stand and like all the other kids to utter two words. And the words were listen and rabbit. So to the best of my ability, I stood and I said those two words confidently and proudly. And I said, listen, and wab it. And everybody waffed, George, and I didn't know why. So I repeated those words again even louder. I said, listen and wab it. And once again, everybody waffed even louder. So I went home tired and depressed and frustrated. And I said to my parents, my teacher, Ms. Northrop, is crazy. She claims that I need speech correction lessons. She's wrong, and I'm going to prove it. So for the next two and a half to three years, I had to work on a skill that I didn't have. And eventually I was able to enunciate and articulate and communicate. And that little boy who couldn't speak eventually grew up to become an attorney and a hall of fame speaker and a best-selling author and a TV and radio broadcaster. So I tell people, George, hey, if I could overcome my perceived difficulties, if you think you can, if you think you can't, you're right. And that's the significance of skills, attitude, and behavior over time. People, as you and I both know, look for the quick hit, the magic bullet. It does not happen. I often tell clients the only place where success precedes work is the dictionary. That must have been painful for you as a grade one student. When you're speaking today, do memories of that pain come back to you? Well, what's interesting is that looking back on it, and even at the time, it was never a painful experience. Now, here's why. It was positioned so that it was an opportunity to excel at something. And Donna Northrup, my first grade teacher, knew that I had natural communication skills at a very young age, but she knew I had to overcome this obstacle. So here's what it enabled me to do. The campus that I grew up on is the Lincolnwood community. So Lincolnwood is a northern suburb of Chicago. It literally shares a common border. We are the first suburb north. So that's where I grew up as a child. So we had all the campuses for kindergarten through second grade, one building third grade through fifth grade, another building, then sixth through eighth grade, another building. Those three buildings were on this large campus. So I got to leave for my first grade class with my best friend, Mark Liss, to this day, still my best mate. We went through grammar school, high school, college, law school together, traveled Europe, best man at my wedding, and he does all my intellectual property work. Mark and I would leave class go to the other building for the third through fifth graders, and we got to escape three times a week. And then we'd return. So it was really an opportunity to do something that was enjoyable. So I never really looked at it as a painful experience. Now, Donna Northrup passed away several years ago, but I've always stayed in touch with her. And I actually went with Donna to a Chicago Cubs game. It's one of the most memorable moments in my life was to spend that time with who I call this gorgeous redhead. And a story about Donna and I actually appears at our website. So Donna changed my life in a positive way. And I actually acknowledge her in one of my books, Peak Your Profits, in the first edition. Now it's the fifth edition. Because Donna really changed my life because she believed in me. And belief is also very important, as you well know, George, to be an effective communicator. And it starts with self-belief. So for me, it really wasn't painful. 
it, it was enjoyable because it's something that I loved at an early age. And it really shaped my entire career. And I had no idea until someone who was interviewing me asked me about that. So they said that one experience really set in motion your career. And I went, yeah, how come I never thought of that until you asked me the question? So for me, not painful, actually significant, meaningful, and memorable. Jeff, there's a powerful example of how a teacher, how a person in your life can have a tremendous effect on, on the students uh, in the class. Absolutely. And because I wonder how many people remember the name of their first grade teacher, but yet you remember because she had such an impact. And who would think that grade one could be so pivotal, so pivotal in your life, but, uh, but obviously it clearly it was. Now, as a child, I understand you experienced other communication joys and challenges. One of them has something to do with a concert. You were, obviously, you were a guitarist. One of them has something to do with a concert that you attended in Chicago. Tell us about that. So I'll tell you a very quick story because it actually has got a communications message about an intended message at the end of the story. All right, so let's throw back the hands of time, George. So imagine, if you will, it's 1964. In 1964, I am eight. My older sister, Linda, is 12. My parents drop us off at the Chicago Amphitheater, south side of Chicago. They drop us off at 7 p.m. and say they will pick us up four hours later at 11 p.m. Let me repeat, George. I am eight. My sister is 12. Parents drop us off at seven, will pick us up at 11, four hours later. Today, my parents would still actually be in jail for child abandonment. <laughs> but this is the 1960s. Who were my sister and I going to see? Four guys from Liverpool, the Beatles. So my sister Linda and I actually saw the Beatles perform in Chicago in 1964. Let's skip ahead to 1978. In 1978, Mark Liss, who I alluded to earlier, who I went to speech collection lessons with, Mark and I, best buddies, we are now traveling Europe. Eight weeks, 22 bucks a day. We find ourselves, George, in the south of France in Monaco at the Lowe's Casino. I turned to Mark and another guy who we were traveling with at the time, who we just met in Europe, but he tagged along with us, a guy by the name of Cosmo Andy. Not his real name, the name that we gave him. I cannot tell you what his real name is. I've got no clue, but he was Cosmo Andy. So I turned to Cosmo Andy and I turned to Mark and I said, hey, you see that dude who's sitting at the bar? They go, yeah. I said, that's Ringo Starr. They said, no, it's not. I said, I'm telling you, that's Ringo Starr. They said, well, how do you know? I said, well, I'm a Beatles fan. I saw him in concert at the age of eight. I have followed their career and I'm a disc jockey from both high school and college. And then obviously the professional work that I eventually did. But I said, I know Ringo Starr plus he lives in Monaco, no taxes. I said, I need to go chat with Ringo Starr. They go, you can't do that. I go, why, what's the big deal? What's the element of embarrassment? If it's not him, it's not him, who cares? So that's an important question to ask yourself often, and that is what's the risk of doing nothing? What's the risk of doing nothing? So I start to walk toward Ringo Starr, and as I'm approaching him, he turns and looks at me from a distance of about 15 to 20 feet away, and he's already got, George, this dismissive look like, get away, don't bother me. Doesn't say anything, but his message is loud and clear. So I say to myself, okay, what would the typical fan do? Typical fan would go, excuse me, are you Ringo Starr? So I say to myself, be unique. So I craft a question in those next few feet. So now when I get close to him, he turns, and this is exactly what I said to Ringo Starr in that summer of 1978. I said, excuse me, has anyone ever told you that you've got a remarkable resemblance to Richard Starkey? And as you know, that's his real name. <laughs> and he says to me, well, mate, I am Richard Starkey. Why don't you sit down and join me? 
I sit down and now have this 10 to 15 minute conversation with Ringo Starr. I tell him about Cosmo Andy and Mark being non-believers. He finds this hysterical. Now after about 10 minutes, Mark and Cosmo Andy George realize this is really Ringo Starr. So they start to come closer to us in an attempt to break this circle of trust that I've created with Ringo. Eventually, as they get closer and are about three feet away, so help me, this is what Ringo Starr says. He looks at Mark and Cosmo and looks at me, looks at Mark and Cosmo, looks at me, looks at Mark and Cosmo, looks at me, and then Ringo Starr actually says the following, George. Hey, Jeff, tell me, are these the two idiots? So to this day, it's a story that Mark and I always talk about because he, Ringo Starr, conveyed his intended message and I conveyed my intended message by asking him a question that he did not expect. And that's actually a skill. That's one of the things that I work on with clients is the ability to ask really good questions or what I call power probes. So it avoids doing with customers and prospects or clients data dumps. Instead, you ask intelligent questions. Now, when on the topic of asking questions, here's a question that people ask other people quite often. It's a common question. And I believe you have a, a better response to this question. And this is the typical networking question. So what do you do? So let me address a few strategies regarding that. And then immediately after that, if you'd like, I can share some key, what I call power probes that the folks listening can actually use. And we'll give them an opportunity to get what I call a sweet 16 of power probes that we'll do especially for your listeners. So let's address though the question that you just brought up in terms of, so what do you do? Most folks are not very good, George, at addressing that question. How come? Well, it's not responsive. If you ask most people what it is that they do, they really don't answer the question. What they do do is they give you a noun. They give you a title. So what do you do? I am a CEO, business owner, president, account executive. I'm in industrial supplies or whatever it is. So they really give you what I call the is. They don't give you the does. And decision makers do not care about the is, they care about the does. So here's a way to be able to overcome that. So listeners, take out a pen, take out a pencil, hit your keyboard, and I want you to jot down now these four words, results, benefits, advantages, outcomes. One more time, results, benefits, advantages, outcomes. That's what's really driving the decision of your decision maker is the results, benefits, advantages, and outcomes that you can deliver to them to help them attain a more favorable future by improving their condition. And I always stress that to people, George. Those are the two driving motivators for every decision maker. Number one is how do you improve their condition? And number two is how do you help them attain a more favorable future? So once you've jotted down results, benefits, advantages, and outcomes, now quickly, don't take 10 minutes, take about the next 90 seconds and get down. Now it's cool to do a data dump. Get down as many results, benefits, advantages, and outcomes that you, your products, your services, your team, your company can deliver to decision makers and decision influencers, customers, clients, or prospects. That's what people really want to know. And I can give you an example or examples if you like. Go ahead. So when folks used to ask me years ago, and I'm talking about decades now, so Jeff, what do you do? Here's what I used to say, George. I am a speaker. <laughs> and people went, eh. oh. <laughs> so uh, what do you speak on? I go, ooh, let me tell you all about me. George, you and I both know nobody cared. Nobody cared. And then a wonderful guy, a terrific client, fellow by the name of Jim Allen, had the great pleasure and privilege to work with Jim in the growth of three of his companies that he was leading. And he once said to me, this is now decades ago, he said, you know, he said, Jeff, I don't look upon you as being a speaker, a trainer, or a consultant. 
I really see you as being a business growth specialist. I figure, George, if he thinks it, I is it. So that language stuck. So when someone now asks Jeff, so what do you do? I respond with the following or an abbreviated or adapted form based upon who I'm talking to, based upon what is their title? Are they a CEO? Are they a VP of sales and marketing, et cetera? Because that's really my decision maker. My decision maker is the C-suite. So go ahead and ask me now, George, Jeff, so what do you do? Jeff, so what do you do? George, my clients say I'm a business growth specialist. I help folks like you, CEOs, your senior leadership team, salespeople, and other executives sleep really, really well at night. And then I pause. And typically, George, what happens is they say, um, well, how do you do that? Now, George, everybody is different. What's cooking in your business? So I make it all about you. It is not about me. And that's when it leads into the ability to ask really good questions. So at a minimum, I'm going to encourage your listeners now to develop what I call their dynamic dozen. And a dynamic dozen, George, is at least 12 open-ended need development questions or power probes. They begin with a who, a what, a when, a where, a why, a which, a how, or a tell me more about. They cannot be answered yes or no. So sometimes they get pushback. Whoa, whoa, are you telling me never to ask a closed-ended question? Not what I said. Closed-ended questions are okay two times. First, for qualification purposes, to determine is this a prospect or a suspect? Are they a pretender or are they a player? And second is it's decision time. Yay or nay, green light, moving forward, creating progress. But the rest of the time, open-ended questions. Who, what, when, where, why, which, how, tell me more about. I'll give you samples and give your listeners samples of questions. And I've got hundreds of them, but here are just a few. Hey, George, tell me more about some of the challenges that you're currently confronting. What will you value most in our relationship? What do your customers especially appreciate about you and your people? Hey, George, when it comes to skills, attitudes, and behaviors with your team, what are they not doing that you wish they were doing? Conservatively, as a result of your folks not being able to, and we fill in the blank, George, based upon what they want to, but let's say conservatively, based upon your folks not being able to sell or market or serve or negotiate as well as you'd like them to conservatively, what do you think you're losing on an annual basis? And I have people quantify that. So recently I had three leaders all quantify dollar ranges from 3 million up to 20 million that they felt they were losing on an annual basis. Now, the reason that I asked that question is when I eventually come back with a decision or a strategy or multiple strategies or solutions that will help them generate those dollars. And if my solutions are somewhat less than 3 million to $20 million, then I became a no brainer. Now, here's why the questions are so important. They create high levels of trust. And when trust is high, George, what's low? Fear. Let me repeat that. When trust is high, what's low? Fear. That's how you create this collaborative relationship to be a partner, not a vendor. And I tell folks that partners are invaluable. Vendors are expendable. So if your listeners, if your viewers would like to get key questions, we'll give them what we call a sweet 16. Here's all they need to do. Simply send an email to Cheryl, that's S-H-E-R-Y-L, S-H-E-R-Y-L, at jeffblackman.com, my first and last name. Cheryl at Jeff, J-E-F-F, Blackman, black like the color, M-A-N.com. And in the subject, all they need to put, George, is sweet 16, George rocks. That's it. Sweet 16, George Rocks will know exactly how they found out. They watched this video. 
They heard the podcast, and we will send them this sweet 16 of questions that others have found incredibly helpful and very valuable. Not my opinion, my experience. Now, let me allude to the language that I just used. I said, not my opinion, my experience. My recommendation is you and I both know words matter. Being trained as an attorney, I discovered that one word change really changes things. My recommendation is that anybody listening or watching replace the word opinion with experience. So don't speak from your opinion because that is only your subjective offering from your personal perspective. But when you talk about others' experience or your experience, it's now based upon what? It's now fact. It's now proven. Been there, done that, just as you said, it's now proven. Just a subtlety, but that's an example of one word making a difference. We have agreements with clients. We don't have contracts. I'm an attorney, but we don't have contracts. We have agreements. We don't have terms. We make requests. We don't request a down payment. Why would you ask for a payment that might get people down? We ask for initial investment. We don't have products. We have business growth tools. Is it a euphemism? Yes, but it's far better language. So these are the kinds of things that I think about and then I coach my clients, whether I'm working with a team or one-to-one, -one, think about this language. It really matters. It conveys your intended message. Yeah, that's a fabulous offer, the Sweet 16, because as we both know, questions, questions are what drive relationships and conversation and relationships and, and demonstrate value and understanding. And yet so many people don't put enough thought into the types of questions they ask. Hey, are you Ringo versus, has anyone told you, you bear striking <laughs> resemblance to Richard Starkey. Uh, that, that's, a fabulous, uh, that's a fabulous insight right there, right there, just to be different. Now, when it comes to questions and word choice, how can those techniques be applied to communicate more effectively with C-level decision makers? C-level decision makers are interesting. So over 38 years of being in business, I've had the great privilege and opportunity to work with all kinds of folks. And that's one of the things people say to me is, Jeff, you have the ability to relate to someone who's on the front line or somebody who's in the boardroom. I've discovered, you've discovered, we've both been around a while, folks are just folks. So therefore, they really want to establish something that's relatable as opposed to placing someone on a pedestal. But there are commonalities. So there are certain commonalities that I've discovered among CEOs. And this is true whether I'm working with a CEO and they might have sales of less than a million. They could be in the five to $30 million range. They could be in the $100 million range. And I've worked with publicly traded companies and they've got billions in terms of their revenue. doesn't matter. The commonalities are the same. So let me share with your listeners and your viewers some commonalities. I've created a list of 35, but I'll share with you some key ones. So some of the key ones are they like, meaning CEOs like to talk about their vision for the future. So with a new client, that's one of the questions that I simply asked him, and we were good for 10 to 15 minutes, plain and simple. Tell me about your vision for the future. So CEOs like to talk about their vision what they dream about, what they anticipate into the future. And they will always devote time, effort, and energy that helps them either maximize gain or minimize loss. They're interested in terms of how they can drive revenue as well as protect market share, reduce expenses, etc. So they like to talk about growth, profitability, opportunity. They detest know-it-alls. They detest surprises. They really respect honest, direct feedback. When I work with the C-class, or for that matter, anyone who I'm coaching, I'll often ask them this question. How would you like me to communicate? Do you want me to be honest or diplomatic? They always say the same thing, George, be honest. Now, I'm always direct, I'm always honest, but I never use that language. So I never say, let me be honest to tell the truth, honestly, let me be frank. Absurd, if you are always those things, as you well know, you don't need to state it. 
And one of the greatest compliments that I ever got, George, was years ago from a financial services client. And I worked with him and his folks for years because they had me on retainer for multiple years. And he said to me, you know, Blackman, one of the things that I really value in our relationship is the fact that you, you never protect your butt and you never kiss mine. So he knew that I'd always give it to him straight. There's a tendency for people to acquiesce and appease. And I let my clients know, if it's not in your best interest, I'm pushing back. I am going to challenge you. However, it's a two-way street. It's not unilateral. If I say something that you want to disagree with, push back, challenge me. That's what really creates opportunity for the future. And they love it because they're not going to necessarily get that from their people. Their people are in cover your butt mode as opposed to let me give it to you direct and honest. They're fearful. I'm not fearful. I will only do what's in the best interest of a client. If I don't think it's in their best interest, even if they want to pay me, I tell them I won't do it. This will not serve you well. We'll give you all the money up front. Uh -uh. Sorry, we'll not do it. And they actually appreciate that direct candor. They appreciate that honest approach. So those are just a few of the things that those in the C-suite really respect and they really value. It's unusual for one, when, when, when one speaks to a CEO, a C-suite individual, for the person speaking not to be worried about covering their butt or kissing the others. And, and yet it's important to not do those things. And that's important for us to establish a peer relationship, not superior, inferior. So we've got to be collaborative. And they've got to understand my only singular focus is what's in their best interest. And thankfully, I've been blessed to have terrific relationships with all different types of C-class leaders because they know that's the nature of our relationship because it will always be based upon honesty, candor, and trust. When those are high, fear is low. Jeff, tell us uh, about your latest book, Peak Your Profit. This is now the, the fifth edition of the book. It's one of many books you've written, but it's the most recent published one. What are the insights that people will gain from this book? Well, let me give you my experience based upon client's experience, because that's what really matters. What really matters is how the book and the strategies have helped others. And I'm going to point out to listeners, notice the use of Jeff, how he just talked about his experience and his client's experience. <laughs> nice phrasing. Powerful. Well, that's one of the things that a client did years ago. And David is still a friend. So he's retired, but David is still a friend. And he was one of my early clients. And one of the great compliments that he gave me when I was working with his salespeople and his leadership team, he stood. He literally interrupted me during the middle of a results session. And this was decades ago. He said, hey, hey, got to let you know what he shares with you. He does all of this. This stuff works because he's here. He's with us. This stuff works. And it does. I always say that to clients. I go, this stuff works as long as your people will implement these strategies. And that's why I actually have a no risk assurance. And people go to our website and they see it. Plain and simple, I let folks know, hey, if you don't think we're going to help you generate dollars equal to or far greater than the investment, whatever it is, let us know. We'll return the dollars. Never lost the bet. So you're nice enough to ask about the book. Let me give you what clients and readers have told me. And the reason that the fifth edition focuses on others' results is that it's a system. So it's a system, and it truly is an explosive business growth system, as others have defined, it, because it focuses on multiple skills, sales, marketing, negotiations, and service. All of those work together. They are not mutually exclusive. And I stress to people that Business George is really about acquisition, satisfaction, and retention of customers and clients. You better be good at all three. If you are not, you might be terrific at getting business, but boy, if you can't take good care of folks, you are going to lose them. And you and I both know the cost of acquisition for a new customer, which by the way, is one of the questions that I ask new clients ago, what's the cost of acquisition for a customer? And that leads into, well, what role do referrals then play? Because that's another skill that we've worked on with people generating hundreds of millions of dollars 
for them. Why? It's a lead with no acquisition cost. It requires a different skill set, but it can be taught. So the greatest benefit of the fifth edition is that it works based upon others, people's experience. And that's the greatest kick that I get, George. When people say to me, hey, got to let you know what happened when I did. And I go, terrific. The focus is always on action. Not what you know, it's what you do. Not ideas, implementation. Books, the book works not because it's theory, but because it's based on experience. And we share lots of examples, lots of how to's and lots of success stories. So I'll share how it works specifically for here's what they did. Here's what they implemented. And that's the greatest success. I had a new client, the CEO said, hey, why should we use you? And I went, my opinion doesn't matter. I said, what really matters is what my clients who have preceded you have said. And you are welcome to talk to as many as you'd like. The question is how much time do you want to devote to talking to others? If you'd like, we'll give you a long list. Their success, their results is the only thing that has driven my success and my results. To which you said, I'm good, let's do it. And then we move forward. You create what I call a parade of progress. And, and again, I point out to listeners and viewers, notice the, the specific words that, that Jeff had just used there. He says, you could, I could tell you about it, but what's more important is what my clients' experience were, what they said about their experience. That's relevant. Now he's not bragging. Now he's simply reporting the, the experience and the facts. So that, those are powerful word choices. Peak Your Profits is the name of the book. It's available on Amazon. We'll put a, we'll put a link to it in the description on the podcast, as well as the, the cover of the book. And for those who want to get regular tips from Jeff, there is a newsletter called The Results Report. They can sign up for that at your website. The website is jeffblackman.com. Jeff with Probably Somebody's seven. calling to register right now, George. Right now they're calling. <laughs> they're powerful. <laughs> Somebody already. <laughs> it's working, Jeff. And, and, and with that, Jeff, my final question is this. If you could give advice to the CEOs out there, advice in terms of growing their business, because that's what you specialize in. If there's one, two, or three tips that you would tell them or remind them of to do more consistently, because it is about reps, as you pointed out, what would be those one, two, or three repeated activities you would have them do? Uh, what a terrific question. Also, let me address, that was my private line that was ringing, and the private line never kicks into voicemail. So that was the private line. That's why it continued to ring. So let me share with you what I call the world's fastest strategic plan, George, because it works for a CEO, but it works for a salesperson. It works for somebody in customer service. It works for somebody in ops. It works for everybody. And the world's fastest strategic plan is simply three questions. Where are you? Where would you like to be? And how do you want to get there? So a CEO can use that question when they are chatting with their people. They can also use it when they are chatting with prospects and customers or clients. Where are you? Where would you like to be? And how do you want to get there? And it really focuses on the ability and prior to you and I hopping together for this interview about 30 minutes before I got a text from a coaching client and he told me about an upcoming strategic meeting. So I let him know that I'd be able to chat with him later in the day, but to focus on three things beginning with the letter P. And they really work around this umbrella of where are you, where would you like to be, and how would you like to get there? I said, one, know your purpose for every call that you make. Number two, know your power probes, the questions that you intend to ask before you make the call. And number three, know what your desired outcome is so you can keep things moving forward, meaning, progress. So it's about purpose, it's about power probes, and it's about progress. Most people, I'm going to flap my wings now, most people wing it. They do not prepare. So it really brings us full circle now. And the full circle is that it focuses on the significance of preparation. Most people wing it, George. 
And when something is wung, that's my made up word. When something is wung, it might soar, but there's a greater likelihood it's going to crash and burn. So CEOs, salespeople, leaders, managers, what they really need to do is discover how do I improve one's condition? How do I help them attain a more favorable future, internal or external? That happens by asking really good questions, taking the time to listen, show a sincere interest in another human being, help them convert their fear to faith. And that's what really drives results for the short term and for the long term. Powerful advice to end on. My guest today is Jeff Blackman, emphasizing results, benefits, advantages, and outcomes. If you like what you heard, remember to like, comment, and share this podcast. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you deliver your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok.